So anyway, we are going to get into the Word this morning. Um, I'm going to do just a little mini-series this, this week, this week and next week. There's a part one and a part two to this, this message that I'm doing. It's too much to squeeze into one, and it's something I'm really passionate about. But to kick it off, uh, our drama team, a portion of our drama team is going to do a little something special for you to kick off this message today. Hey, Jesus, listen, I made a decision. I want you to have this. Wow, Abby, that's a huge decision. Are you sure? Yep, I want you to sit here. You know that whoever sits in this seat makes all the decisions for the whole day. Yep, you're a way better decision maker than me. I want you to sit here. I want you to make the decisions. That's great. I trust you completely. I know you do a great job. Hey, Abby, today's the day I'm getting my belly button pierced. I was wondering if you wanted to come with me. Well, if your mom said you couldn't get that done, what'd she say about it now? Who cares? There's no way she was going to let me do it. But she's out for the week, and I would just decide to do it anyway. You want to come? No. No? Why not? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'll have to get back with you later. I'll see what I have going on right now. Okay, just let me know when you decide. Jesus, what's up? What's going on? Well, I thought uh, I was making all the decisions today. Well, yeah, but that decision was silly. I mean, what's wrong with her getting her belly button pierced? Well, number one, she's not listening to her mother. That's a big problem. And she needs to respect her mother. I thought I was making all the decisions today. Okay, you're right. Here, sit here. It's all right. It's just going to take some getting used to. Yeah, I guess you're right. Hey, Abby, I know your parents said you can't watch the movie It, but my parents just bought it. Want to come over and watch it with me? No. No. No? What do you mean, no? Everyone in school is watching it. Well, I don't know. I'll have to get back with you later. Okay, see you later. What's going on? Well, I really wanted to watch that. <laughs> I thought I was making all the decisions. Well, here. Take it. No. Abby, you have to want to give it to me. Why can't you just take it? Abby, you need to make a choice here. It's either me or it's you. Well, I want you to sit here. Can you help me? Yes, I think we can work on that. Good job. Oh, Our drama team, ladies and gentlemen, and I didn't many know members of them. That hard. I, think, I think the mic is still on. Don't go to the bathroom. Okay. You might have noticed that Abby, who played the, the person kind of wavering in their faith a little bit, was wearing a Michigan State shirt. <laughs> which is really appropriate seeing that as Michigan State fans tend to waver in their faith, but we'll get into the message. So, uh, just trying to stay true to the, the real world. Okay. Uh, anyway, things get interesting when people stay at their aunt and uncle's house that are state fans. Okay. Good job, drama team. I'm proud of you. Way to go. So, they kind of set the table for me about our message today. Um, what I want to talk about for two weeks, I'm calling the name, I'm calling this, this series Out of Order. Out of Order. I'm calling it Out of Order because I think a lot of us, we may not look at it like what you just saw, but, but oftentimes there's this wrestling match. We're like, Lord, I want you on the throne of my life. I want you on the throne of my heart. I want you to have the driver's seat. But so often it's so subtle the flesh wants what it wants, and we find ourselves kind of pushing Jesus off the stool. You know, like, well, I want you, but, you know, I want to do what I want to do, too. And so what I want to look at for two weeks in a row is what I would consider one of the ways that we can keep Jesus on the throne. And one of the ways we can watch and see, uh, uh, you know, kind of a little test of our heart. Am I keeping him on the throne? Am I keeping him in, on the driver's seat? And, and one of the ways we do that, my friends, is to put the things first in our life that Jesus says to put first. 
or are we out of order? Because Jesus is, he's very specific in scripture. I don't know if you know this. I did a little study on the word first. If you ever do a Bible study and you just Google or look in your, in your strongest concordance on, on the word first, you'll see that the Lord is very clear about things first. And, and so when you get out of order and put things not first that God says to, it can, it can really it can really have an effect on every area of your life. And so for two weeks, I want to look at, rather than trying to cram it all into one, what are some of the things that God says to do first, and am I out of order? Or, or am I like, yeah, man, I'm nailing that. I am, I am walking in the things in order that the Lord is telling me to. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I brought this up once for a different analogy, but here's another one. About a month ago, you remember, we lost power, a lot of us in Marlette and all around this area. We lost, we had that big wind day and a lot of us lost power, and that's when I realized that I had an attachment where I can plug right into my house for my generator, and I was all excited because I didn't even realize I had it. You know, I've been in the house a year and a half, and, and then all of a sudden I realized when you go to my, my panel downstairs, my breaker panel, it's got like seven things you do to hook it up, and it's all in order. And, and you don't want to wing that, you know? You don't want to come down there and just say, uh... Let's see, this one, and I'll go that one. I'm not going to listen to it. No, because you could get a little thing called, I don't know, electrocuted, and, uh, and maybe electrocute a guy working on a power line if you backfeed the line. It was a great education. I learned how to do it in order. And, you know, God has an order to things. And so every time he says first in the Bible, it's not just because he needs room for a five-letter word. He's like, what do I put here? How about first? There's a, there's a reason for it, you know? And there's something that's it's, it's dear to the heart of God when we put him first. You know, this Thursday... This beautiful woman right here and I will have been married 21 years. Our marriage is now old enough to drink. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. We're not gonna, I don't even know what that means. So we're not going to do that. But anyway, but you know what's amazing? I'll never forget the day that I proposed to her. I never for, I'll never forget what led up to that. But can I tell you something? If I went up to my wife or a soon-to-be wife that day and proposed to her, and she said, yes. How do you think she would feel if I turned around and said, whew, I'm so glad you said yes. I've just asked five other girls in the last few months, and they've all said no. But I finally got to you, and you said yes. I'd probably be shot, right? Or maybe kick somewhere. Because who wants to be third, fourth, fifth on the list? It was her and her only. You know, and, and when the Lord says first, like, like so often we go to him later. You know what I mean? God, I'll get to you. I got other solutions to my problems, and then I'll get to you eventually. But, man, let me tell you something that I'm learning more and more as I get older in the Lord, and that is, man, if only I, I just want to run to him first for everything. Do I always get that right? No. No, I don't. But I want to, and I see the difference in my life. So that's what we're going after for two weeks. And to start this off, I want to go and read a verse to you in Matthew Chapter 6, verse 33, a very, very popular quoted verse a lot. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Now, we quote that a lot. We do. We quote that a lot. But the beautiful thing about this verse is what makes it so awesome is the context. Is the context what leads before it. You see, my, my daughter who was up here speaking a few minutes ago, she had no idea what I was speaking on, and I had no idea what she was going to say. And so often the Lord will do that and just kind of confirm something. Let me read something to you that leads up to this whole idea of seeking first the kingdom. If you back up to verse 25, it says a little something like this. Jesus is speaking to us. He says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Let's just stop there for a second. Like, that's almost like everybody on some level. Most people I meet, if they're going to be honest, that's, that's kind of the, the struggle. I'm anxious about my life. But right off the bat, Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life. And he goes on. He says, well, well, what you will eat or what you will drink, don't be anxious about your body. What you will put on is life more than food. There was a time that I would have questioned that question, but uh, I've moved on. And the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Now, let me just make a few points here. Number one, this verse is not just limited to clothing or food or what you're going to wear. I know that that seems like the thing. But if you look at the deeper meaning, the very first thing he said, don't be anxious about your life. Represented in this room right now, I'd have to believe, and we don't have to go around the room and pass the mic. We don't have time, really. But, but there's probably people, not to put this on you, that, that might be wrestling with some anxiousness about something in your life. What will I do here? And what will I do there? And this is my favorite part of this context is the Lord says this. He says, look at the birds. I take really good care of them. And you are way more valuable than they are. This is what I want you to hear first and foremost this morning. This is why we can seek him first in everything in our life because you are very valuable to the Lord. Let that sink in for a moment. I don't want to rush over that thought. I want you to hear that this morning, that the Lord has given us this invitation to not be anxious about our life because he wants us to know how valuable we are. We're not just these people he puts up with. We're not just these like, oh, those humans, I can't stand them. I'm stuck with them now. No, he says, man, you are so valuable to me. That's why you don't have to be anxious about your life. But then he gives the remedy for this. He gives the remedy. Seek me first. My friends, whatever you're running after, whatever you're looking to, to get some, some remedy for the anxiousness in your life, man, don't, you know, maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it is just the, some other stress of life. This is what he's saying. Seek me first. My friends, when you make that the agenda, that you seek him first, first. I cannot, I, I cannot, I wish I could just like take that truth and implant it into you and into me too. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then he adds a little something and, and he says, seek first the kingdom and my righteousness, his righteousness. What does that mean? See, here's the beautiful thing with the word of God. I told you, I didn't lie to you. I told you every week I'm going to find a way to irritate you about reading your word. Hopefully it's not irritating because this is what he means by seek my righteousness He's saying, I have a way of doing things that is right. Are you seeking my righteousness, my way of doing things? I know how to do finances, the Lord is saying. Are you doing it my way? Are you doing it your way, wanting my results? I know how to do relationships, he's saying. Are you doing it your way? Are you doing it my way? You know, I, uh, I've been pounding something into my kids since they were little, and I pounded into you too because I see us all as family. But I've seen too many times people who are hungry for relationships, because we all get lonely. We all want somebody in our life, you know, we do. And, and so often we'll settle because we're lonely. We just want somebody. And I'll see people that love Jesus find a relationship with somebody who doesn't love Jesus and then suddenly try to force them into their Christian life. I did this. I remember when I, long before I met that beautiful lady, I remember at 18 years old, I was a Christian, I was on fire, and I met this girl at work, and I just thought she was awesome. There was just one problem. She didn't love Jesus, but she was fun, and she was cool, and we got along, and it was great. And so I remember bringing her to church one time, because I'm like, all I got to do, I just got to get her saved. It's all I got to do. It's called missionary dating. I don't know if you ever heard of that. And, and, and I'd bring, I brought her to church, and my pastor back then was this fire, hell, hellfire and brimstone preacher, you know, and he's preaching this message. And it's strong, and I'm like loving it, and I'm on the edge of my seat, as Kurt Gilchrist would say, and I'm on the edge of my seat loving it. And I look over at her, and she's like, <gasps> you know, just smiling at me, yawning. Like, I'm like thinking, oh, man, and it kind of hit me. It's like, this isn't working. And the Lord has shown me, here's the order. There's the order. You know what it is? It's run after God with all your heart, and you won't be able to miss God's choice for your life. That's the order. When I met that girl, I was running full speed after Jesus. I gave up looking everywhere. I was looking under every rock. I was looking everywhere I went for my future wife. Because in the Christian circle I grew up with, if you weren't married by 21, it was weird. You know, it was just, it was a crazy circle. Everybody got married too young. I don't understand why. If you got married at 21, that's okay. She was 20. And you were 20. I know. You didn't know better. But anyway, um, 
21 later, you're kind of, 21 years later, you're kind of stuck. But uh, no, age is not the issue. My point is this, my friends. When you do things in God's order, you, won't, you don't want to miss his will. You know what I mean? Sometimes it works out. I've seen people bring somebody, and they get saved, and they're running after God. And I love when that happens. But listen, the order that God has is run after me, and you won't be able to miss my choice for your life. I was running, she was running, and we smacked right into each other. Suppose somebody's nose didn't break. We were smacked, we were just looking, you know, and, and I just, young people, I'm a, I'm a daddy with young kids, so you have to forgive me. I speak a lot to young people. A lot of you are parents and grandparents. Really go after this one with your kids. Don't let them mess this one up, because who you end up with is going to influence every area of your life. And here's where I've, here's the, here's the heartbreaking thing I've seen before, and I don't want this for anybody. I've seen people bring them to church, I'm like, wow. They really seem to be growing. They, this, this worked out. It worked out. And all of a sudden, there's a breakup or something. Guess what happens? I never see that guy or girl again because it was based on the dating relationship. It was never based on Jesus. And that's why I just want you to get things in the proper order, my friends. I'm just talking to you as somebody who loves you so much. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I don't love you where I just want to give you some half-truths so that you'll like me and never be offended by anything. Man, not that I want to offend you, but I want to be challenged, don't you? I don't want to just like not be challenged in my walk with God. I know I got stuff to be stretched on, and I want to be challenged. And so um, seek first the kingdom of God. I want to move to my next point here, and that is this, my next first uh, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be spending a lot of time in Matthew today. A lot of times I make you jump all over, but today we're camping out in Matthew quite a bit. Matthew chapter 5. I got another first for you. So the first one we looked at is seeking him first and his righteousness. You know, hold on, let me just say one more thing on this. You know what will help you in, in your word reading, reading your word? Ron Lentz uh, and I were talking a couple weeks back, and he was sharing with our group. He goes, you know, I I'm just going to confess I need to be in my word more. You know, he just was transparent. He put it out there, and he said it to our whole group. And then my wife says, well, maybe you could be accountable with somebody because that's what she does. She has an accountability partner. So Ron and I became accountability partners. And the difference that it makes, this guy's texting me every day all the things he's reading. I don't have time for this, but he's texting me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love it. I love it. I love it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. But he's texting me. Sometimes I get convicted because he's reading more than me, so I just text back, make something up. I don't want him to look more holy. I'm the pastor. No, I don't do that. I don't lie to him. But no, I love it. And the difference it makes when you get somebody that you know is going to check on you. And is it making a difference in your life? You don't even steal half as much. I mean, see how it's changing him? So, but my friends, get an accountability partner. Because reading your word is vital. The only thing more vital than reading your word is obeying what it says. You'll notice people that don't obey, they get up in the middle of service. But most people <laughs> do pretty good. <laughs> Who's her parents? Get that girl in line. Okay. Um, so get an accountability partner if you don't have one. That's going to text you every day and say, did you get your word today? Did you get your word today? Right? So many of you, man, you won't miss a workout to save your life. And that's great. You'll be half dead, but you're going to get to that gym, but you won't open that Bible, right? So you can work out for that body. I meet people that tell me they're anxious. They can't even work because they're so anxious. They're on anxiety, you know, disorder. They can't work. I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying, but, but what I want to ask sometimes, and sometimes because I I don't, want to be, I don't want to come off too strong sometimes, but I need to get better about, about this, is I, I'll, I need to ask them more often. Can I ask you a question? Are you seeking God first? How much time are you reading your word? You know what you'll probably find? And, and I'm, I'm not saying everybody. I know sometimes people go through some extreme things. I get that. But I can't tell you how many people I meet that cannot work because they're anxious. And here's my first question. Are you seeking the Lord? Are you seeking the Lord in his righteousness? Well, no, I'm not. Well, now I understand. <laughs> Do you feel the love? I'm saying it out of love. I mean, I got to stand before the Lord one day, folks. You know, I don't want him to say, why did you sugarcoat everything? Why don't you just tell him my word? And if you're not reading your word and you're not obeying it and you're not seeking his righteousness first, of course you're going to be anxious. Man, if I didn't read his word and do what he says, I'd be right next to you getting my prescription too. Know what I'm saying? I'd be like, man, I'm too anxious to work too. Scoot over. Is there any more of that pill left? I don't know. You know, I don't even know what they're called. 
But my point is, have you tried it God's way? Seek. You know what that word seek means? It's not this little, this, this, is this seeking? Let me ask you. No, not there. That's, that's, that's a tiny look. A seek is, man, I'm, I'm looking, man. Like, I'm searching. Like, my wife says, I can never find anything in the fridge. Because I don't seek. I'm like, where's the eggs? She's like, uh, did you, there, see? You just moved the little thing. But I mean, like, seeking God. Seeking the Lord and his righteousness. Okay, now we'll move on to the next point. I felt like there was more in there. I had to, I had to say it. So Matthew 5, I'm going to read verse 21. Here's another one Jesus is hitting us with, with the, with the word first. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Let's just get this right. Who's, who's murdered somebody this week? Raise your hand. Leslie, I'm going to, somebody call the police. We've got two murderers. It's a crazy church. Okay, um, well, let's move on. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother, ooh, that's none of you. You don't all get angry with your brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift, here it goes, friends. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift here before the altar, and go first, everybody say first. First, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. What is your gift? You know what your gift is? I did a little study on this, in case you're wondering, did your homework for you. Your gift is your worship. So let's say you've come here today, and this is you. You're worshiping, man. Your hands are raised. You're crying. You're singing at the top of your lungs. I will call. I can't sing in key. Wish I could. Oh, that was kind of in key a little bit. I think Deb liked it. I don't know. Um, Here's what the Lord is saying. You're worshiping, man, and the Lord is saying, you know what? Put your hands down. Go make it right with that brother or sister that you have a problem with, and then come back and offer your gift at the altar. Let me tell you something. God does not play games with bitterness. He doesn't play games with unforgiveness. He doesn't play games with holding grudges. I have had people... And I'm not going to name names, of course, but I've had people come to this church and say, what service does so-and-so go to? I'll say, why? Because I want to make sure I go to the opposite. I can't stand them. I don't get along with them. And I'll say, listen, listen. Matthew 18 is very clear. You go to somebody one-on-one. And just for clarity, just because I'm the pastor, I don't need to know who you have a problem with. <laughs> Preach it, right? Like some people will tell me, pastor, I'm only telling you this because you're the pastor, but I don't like this person. I'm like, really, where in Matthew 18 does it say, go to that person with the pastor and tell them your problem? Now it does say if they won't listen to you, go and take another person. Now you've observed this and so have I. I'm not the only one to observe this. Have you ever met people that don't go to church? They're not committed to a church anywhere and you ask them, so do you go to church anywhere? Well, I used to, but I was hurt by the church. Anybody ever heard that one? I was hurt by the church. Some of you came here after being out of church 20 years because you finally gave the church another try. But let me just tell you something. A lot of people have been wounded by the church. But here's my question. Did you ever go to them and try to make it right? Or did you just let the offense grow and check out? Because I think that's what's hap- that what happens. Most people that I know, most people, even, even rotten people that I know, if you're wondering who those are, I'll give you a list later for a fundraiser. Um, most people, well, you might be on there, though, so I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Most people that I know, though, if you come to them with a sincere heart and say, you know what, I know you probably didn't mean this, but you know when you said that one thing, kind of hurt, I've, I've been carrying this offense, most people probably say, oh, brother, sister, I didn't mean that. I'm so sorry. If I, if I would have known that, I would have never said that. You know? And so many, so many things can just be resolved if we just go to somebody and say, hey, I'm upset with you, or I, it feels like you're upset with me. Now, you can't force them. I saw somebody attack our church a couple weeks ago, just said something about us, just out of nowhere. It just like kind of came out of nowhere, and I saw it on Facebook, and, and I, I, I hired a contracted person to take them out. But then I changed my mind, <laughs> and they're still alive. But no, I, I, I reached out to them privately, and I said, hey, it sounds like you have a problem with our church. Uh, I said, listen, I don't know what we've done, but can we sit down and talk? I just want to make it right with you. If I did something to offend you, let's clear it up. 
but they never responded. See, here's the thing. You can't force people to respond. You can't force people to reconcile with you, but you can do your part and be humble and say, hey, I, did I do something? Maybe you did something and you don't even know it, right? And so here's what he's saying. Whether you're the one who's offended or you're the one who you know somebody's offended with you, you can either let the pride well up and just say, you know what? <laughs> You're going to be offended at me. I'll be double offended at you. Or you can say, you know what? Lord, I don't, like, when I know somebody's upset with me, I want to go make it right. Why would I want to make that, like, just be lasting out there? You know what I mean? Even if I didn't even, even if I don't think I'm the one who was wrong, sometimes you just need to be heard. And it feels so good to get that stuff squared away. But even more so, it's a command of the Lord, right? If you read 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians is, is all about Paul addressing the church at Corinth. They were the church that came out of the book of Acts. Remember the book of Acts? Everybody wants to talk about how great the church of Acts was, and that's how we should be. Well, the, the, the church of Acts eventually becomes the church of 1 Corinthians, and they get really messy after a while. And Paul has to write this letter saying, whoa, whoa, you guys are all out of balance. These guys were, were committing adultery and fornication. They were, they were doing all kinds of blasphemy. But you know the very first thing he addressed out of all that stuff? He addressed the disunity among them. That's a hot button for the Lord. So listen, friends, if you're sitting here right now, and again, you don't have to stand up. Let the Holy Spirit just speak to you. If you know that you've got something against a brother or sister, and you've been just waiting to put that, putting it off, maybe you're like, oh, one of these days I've got to make it right with so-and-so. Man, let me tell you something. There's nothing like today. I don't mean like right now. I'll finish the message if you don't mind, but uh, let's not make a scene. Boom, I'm out of here. But don't wait on it, is what I'm saying. Don't wait on it. Make it right. Make it right. Now, if they don't receive it, that's on them. That's on them. And I know some offenses are bigger than others. You might be sitting here, yeah, you don't understand, bro. Somebody shot me. Oh, I'm just supposed to go over there. Oh, that's okay. Thanks for shooting me. No, I mean, here's the thing, though. Make the step in that direction. Let's be honest. So many of our problems are kind of petty. So many of our problems are kind of like, they stepped on my toe, and I don't know if they meant to step on my toe, and now I can't go to that church anymore. I mean, it's like, really? That is Satan working overtime. If you know somebody has a problem, go to them. Go to them. There's no room in the body of Christ for unforgiveness, for bitterness, for grudges. And can I just clarify one thing? Just because you've forgiven them, hear me now, because some people are just not healthy people to be around. They're not. I'm not saying now that you're forgiven, jump right back into a, a horrible situation. Some people, man, you need to stay a million miles an hour from them. They're trouble. They just are. They're trouble. But that doesn't mean you don't forgive them and let it go. Here's what you do. Because I know the issue with forgiveness. I've been there. The reason we struggle with forgiveness so often is because nobody, we all like justice, don't we? I mean, if you sneak in and look in my window sometimes, the movies I like to watch are justice, you know? Like, I'll watch this, like, oh, that felt good. He killed that guy. Oh, Lord, I better not ever do that. That's totally wrong. But, uh, but I like justice a little bit, so I get it. And so all of a sudden, I'm going to forgive someone because we feel like we're letting them off the hook, like we're giving them a pass. But what does the Bible say? It says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. What forgiveness really is is you're saying, okay, Lord, here they are. You deal with them. God's going to deal with them, but it's not your job to deal with them. And if you try to deal with it and carry unforgiveness around, the Bible says it rots the bones. Don't let bitterness creep in. Get rid of it. And maybe you can't go to that person because what it is is so harmful that you're, you're not ready to talk to them. There are those situations. That's where you come before the Lord and you say, Lord, I forgive them. I can't go to them right now because of what happened, but I forgive them. Because I know some things are not just petty. Some things are huge, and I get that. And if you go to them, you might end up killing them. So I don't know why violence always makes it into my messages. I'm really not a violent guy until I preach. <laughs> go figure. Okay, um, let's move on. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. I want to look at another first with you. Oops, Matthew chapter 7, I mean. Not 3. Matthew 7. God bless you. Hope we're good, whoever you are that sneezed. Um, Okay, Matthew 7, verse 3. I know nobody will be able to relate to this one. Why do you see the speck? Let's go back to verse 1. Let's get the whole context. Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. 
Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I'm going to stop right there. Did you notice the word first in there? It says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. So let's kind of examine what this is saying, because we all have people that we just love to critique them, and we love to say, you know, you're really irritating me. You're always doing this, or you're always doing that. This is what Jesus is saying. Before you do that, do some self-examining. Ask yourself, do I do that? Am I dealing with this? This is what the Lord is saying. Every, I'm not saying he's, he's not saying you can never go to somebody and confront something or, or, or correct something. But he's saying there's a way to do it. And the order is first, look at yourself. So here's what I've noticed about myself and, and as I examine people. I'm a people watcher. I'm in the people business. I hear a lot of people. And so I've kind of examined over the many, many years something about people, and that's this. We tend to be irritated by things that people do that we do. You ever notice that? It's like angry people tend to get really irritated at angry people. People that like to brag on themselves a lot get irritated by other people who brag on themselves a lot. And I found that to be the case. I, I, I hate pride. And, and so one of the things that, that I wrestle with in life sometimes is pride, and, and, I, and I see it rise up because pride has many ways that it hides itself, you know, and you don't realize it's pride often, and, and so often I'll just see somebody being prideful. And it's like, me, 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 me. They just all they can talk about is me, and it's like, man, I'm getting a lot of you. And then all of a sudden I feel like I want to confront them, and the Lord is saying, well, let's look at you. How, how much are you important to you? You know what I saw on Facebook the other day? It was pretty good. It said, if God suddenly answered all of your prayers... Would it benefit anybody else other than you? I thought, man, that's good. That's good because we can get really me-focused, right? But it can be any besetting sin. Usually the thing that gets under our skin is something that we do. And so when we see it in somebody else, it's kind of this reflection. I, uh, I remember years ago when we had the answering machines uh, back when I lived with my parents. I was a new Christian. I'm not saying I'm above this now, but I was a new Christian and the, the phone rang at my parents' house, and I answered the phone, and, but the answering machine went off first. You remember those days? And so now the answering machine is recording you. Anybody a dinosaur like me? Remember those? Not a dinosaur, but back in the day, long before voicemail, right? Answering machines. And I'm talking to my buddy, and all of a sudden, I listen back to my own voice on the answering machine. I listen back to my little message, and I'm like, boy, there's a lot of me in there. And I was like, and I, and I did this, and then I did that. And I'm like, dude, that like that. That's like, you know, the Bible says God resists the proud, but so do we, don't we? You know, and so that's like that, that's one for me. I, I don't want to be that person. And anytime I feel that creeping up, I want to smash it because there's so much awesome scripture on humility and putting others first, you know. And so I don't, I don't want that. And, uh, you know, speaking of pride, I heard a story about a man who uh, he got promoted to vice president in his job. And he was so excited, you know, he's just telling everybody, everywhere he went, hey, did you hear about my promotion? <laughs> I'm vice president now. And, and so his wife was kind of getting a little irritated. She's like, it's getting old, man. Everywhere we go, he's bragging about his promotion, you know. And so his wife said to him kind of gently, she says, honey, uh, can I just tell you something? You know, you're really getting a little extreme with this bragging about your promotion. You're telling everybody, she goes, I hate to burst your bubble, but they have a vice president of everything these days, okay? I don't know if you realize that. There's, there's a vice president. She goes, as a matter of fact, at the local grocery store, they even have a vice president of peas in the produce section. She goes, and he's like, no, no, they don't have a vice president of peas. Come on. He's like, no way I'm buying that. And he goes, he goes matter of fact, I'm going to call the grocery store, and we'll find out if there's a vice president of peas. So he calls the grocery store, and he says, uh, yeah, hi, I'd like to... Speak to the vice president of peas, please. And she says, which one, fresh or frozen? <laughs> kind of burst his bubble a little bit. You know, there's one other good one too, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, before he was president and he was running for president, he, uh, he gave this speech in California. And, or actually, it was in Mexico. He was in Mexico and he was a speaker in Mexico. And so he gave a speech to the Mexican people, 
and he noticed there wasn't much response, not much clapping. He kind of felt deflated, you know. He's like, man, nobody's really digging my speech. And uh, so he, uh, he kind of sat down feeling, feeling deflated. Well, then another speaker right after him got up. And this guy spoke Spanish, you know, and, and so Reagan didn't understand a thing he was saying. But he said, whatever this guy was saying, the people were loving it. And they kept clapping, and they were standing up for him. And Reagan's feeling like this big. He's like, man, nobody even clapped with me, but they're loving this guy. He goes, but I don't want it to show that I'm upset, so I'm going to clap even harder than everybody else. Matter of fact, I'm going to get up before anybody else does and show how much I love this message. And, and so he's clapping, and he's, man, woo, man. he's like showing this guy all this appreciation, even though he doesn't know what the guy is saying. And then somebody leans over next to him and says, He's just simply repeating the speech that you just gave. <laughs> anyway, humility, pride can cost you, man, you know, and so I, I like to go after that one. But think about it. Do you self-examine before you correct? Do I do this thing? You know what I tend to want to do when somebody corrects me? And this is the pride in me. So often I want to just say, oh, yeah, well, you do that. You ever done that? I just want to give it back to me. You do that. We're not talking about you, me right now. Well, yes, we are. I want it off of me and on you. You know what I mean? But, oh, my friends, if we follow the Scripture, it's amazing how we will correct things in our own life if we just do things that God says to do first. First, take the log out of your eye. That just sounds painful, having a log in your eye, doesn't it? But, but, but take that out. It'll stop you so many times before you're about to address something. I have one more point I want to make with you. This one's in Luke. I know we were in Matthew for a while, and you don't have to go that far. We're going to head over to Luke 14. Luke 14. And I'm going to ask if the ushers would come forward, because we are going to do, we're going to take communion this morning, my friends. We're going to take some communion this morning. And while they're getting ready to pass that out and passing that out, I want to read a portion of Scripture to you. I got one more I want to read. And we're going to continue this next week. But Luke 14, I'm in verse 25. Starting in verse 25 in Luke 14, it says this. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot my, be my disciple. And then he goes into this little example. He says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That is one of the strongest sections of Scripture, my friends. And can I bring a little clarity if you are new to the Bible? Because if you've never heard this before, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 hold the phone. Hold the phone. I'm supposed to hate my mother and my father and my brother and my sister? He says that's... I mean, I would, if I was one of his disciples, I'd be thinking, whoa, bro, I brought my mom to service today. What are you preaching here? But here's what he's saying. It's not that God actually wants us to literally hate people. But he's saying in comparison to the love we are to have to him, that Jesus is first. And he's saying this. He says, before you even decide, do I want to be a disciple or a follower, count the cost. He says, first count the cost. I think a lot of people love the idea of Jesus as Savior, but might not be interested in Jesus as Lord. You notice what it says here? 
Let me go back to something that we just read. Look at verse 25 with me. Just take this in for a second. Now great crowds accompanied him. Let's stop right there for a second. Great crowds accompanied Jesus. You know what I think of when I read that? I'll give you a little example. Earlier this week, I had a really fun time. Thursday, I went on a field trip with my sixth grade son. We went to Ford Field. Now, I'm a football fan, my friends. I love football. You know what I mean? I love, you know, there, there's like there's U of M football and there's bad teams and other ways, um, you know, like, like my daughter's shirt, but I'm a, I'm a fan of football. And so it was exciting for me to go to Ford Field, and I got to walk out on, of the tunnel onto the field, man. I'm like literally walking on the 50-yard line. I'm standing there, you know, my son's sitting there taking a, I'm taking a picture of a Matthew Stafford's locker, you know. I mean, I'm like a kid at this experience, you know. I'm, I'm standing behind the, I've got a picture of Joe behind the little press conference thing that I always see on TV every week with the Quicken Loans behind you. You know, there we are. You know, I'm like thinking, wow, I can't believe we're getting to do this. This is awesome. But, you know, just like football, you know what my football experience is like? I leave a football game or I, I get done watching a football game and I kind of forget about it till next Sunday. Why do I do that? Because I'm what you call a fan. I'm a fan of the game. I go to the game or I watch it. I'm a fan. For three hours, I am dialed in. But guess what? When the game's over, I'm kind of done. I might look at some highlights or I might see what, what they're saying throughout the week, but it's not really on my mind. You know, I got other things to think about. Well, look at these, look at verse 25. Great crowds accompanying him. You know what? Jesus, my friends, had a lot of fans. A lot of people showed up when Jesus spoke. Maybe they wanted the healing. Maybe they wanted some free food. You know, he turned a lot of bread into multiplied bread and fish and things like that. But at the end of the day, a lot of fans. But only so many were followers. He had 12 diehard followers, but an awful lot of crowds came out. And this is what Jesus says in this portion of Scripture. He says, if you want to be my disciple, first, count the cost. Count the cost. And, and there's, two, there's two groups of people. I know those who are following Jesus in this room, you know that it's worth everything. You know that nothing compares to following Jesus. Matter of fact, you know that the more you surrender to him, the more there's real life. I mean, you wouldn't trade it for anything. That's a disciple. But there's probably still that are like, I don't know. You know, I kind of want to sit on the chair. When you really give God the chair, man, and say, Lord, you just take over. Can I, I, I'm going to make a promise to you. And I'm not saying I perfect everything I preach to you. So please don't. I'm never preaching to you from this elevated, like, I'm awesome and you're not place. I'm preaching to you like we are the body in this stuff together. But let me tell you something. The more I stay off of that chair and the more I let him sit in the chair and totally have full control of my life. And when he says something to me in scripture and says, oh, oh, this is sin. I didn't even realize that. Now I see it. I'm not going to do it. Or at least I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try hard, seek him hard not to do the thing. We don't, he doesn't need fans. That's why he preached. That's why, you know, I don't know what the disciples were like, but sometimes you read, I think the disciples kind of liked being the guys with Jesus, you know, like, hey, we're with, we're with Jesus, man. He's awesome, right? I, I think they kind of got a kick out of that. But Jesus wasn't moved by the crowds because a great crowd was with him. And instead of saying, you don't see Jesus saying this, you notice you don't see Jesus saying, oh, I am so touched that such a great crowd is here. Wow. I've got to be careful what I say because I don't want to, this is a great crowd. I got, to, I got to make sure I don't say anything harsh. What does he say? Unless you hate your mother and your father and your brother and your sister. Oh, and while you're at it, your own life, you cannot be my disciple. He doesn't sugarcoat anything, does he? And so here's my question to you as we take communion this morning, my friends. As we take that bread and we take that cup and we remember what Jesus did. Here's what I want you to ask yourself as you're chewing that bread and drinking that cup. Who's the one sitting on that stool? Is that me? Do I keep saying, Jesus, you got to go? Or is Jesus planted firmly on the throne of my heart? Because that's where life gets awesome. Will he scare you sometimes? Yeah. But I don't want anybody else up there, man. I want Jesus on the throne. So take some self-examination this morning. What do I always tell you, man? If, if, God, if, if you find yourself in the wrong spot, 
Man, Jesus says, repent. Ask forgiveness. Say, Lord, please help me. You have not been in the seat, but I'm putting you back in the seat in Jesus' name and walk it. He is the master of forgiveness. He is the master of restoration. He is the master of getting it back, getting it right. But examine your heart and say, who's on the throne? Because he says, man, I'm glad you want to be my disciple, but first, count the cost. Count the cost, and it's worth every bit of my life to, to give him full control of my life. You will not regret it, my friends, handing the keys completely over to the Lord. Now, the Bible says that Jesus, when he was with his disciples, broke the bread, and he says, this represents my body, which is going to be broken for you. So my friends, let's partake in the bread together. And after that, he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents my blood, which will be shed for you and for your sin. My friends, let's partake of the cup together. Heavenly Father, as we gather here this morning, help us, Lord God. It's fun to go to games. It's fun to go watch our favorite sports team on TV and cheer them on. But, oh, Lord, let us move beyond fans. Let us be followers, Lord. Let us count the cost and, and truly be disciples. You are worthy to be followed. You are worthy of everything that we are. And we so love you, Lord God. And so, Lord, you know everybody in this room. Lord, meet them right where they're at. Show them your goodness. Give them the grace to walk in everything you have for them. We love you so much. And we pray these things now in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, let me just say one last thing to you. If you are here and you say, you know what? I don't know that I've ever really made Jesus the Lord of my life. Let's settle that today. Come talk to me. Come talk to me. Let's, let's put him in the driver's seat. And let's baptize you on August 19th. And let's help you grow and be everything that God has called you to be. Hey, I love you guys. Have an awesome, blessed day. God bless.